Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to IBC's Circle of Fellows, number 96. It's called Leadership and Communication. Uh, my name is Brad Whitworth, and I'm sitting in for our regular host and moderator, Shel Holtz, who is on holiday right now in the Mediterranean. But I want to welcome you, and I want to welcome my entire panel to join me today. Um, I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves, but we're here to talk about leadership and communication, which is a topic that um, is evergreen in some ways, but it's also changing a lot. And so I think we're going to discuss how some of the traits that one may have looked for in communication leadership are constants in the equation, but also talk about how things have been changing over time. So um, I'm going to go on mute and let maybe Diane, why don't you go ahead and say uh, hi to the crowd. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Gayeski from Ithaca, New York. I'm a professor of strategic communication at Ithaca College, and I practice what I preach through Gayeski Analytics. And um, Mark, why don't you say hi to the crowd from uh, hey. Texas? Hey there, I'm Mark Schumann, and I am a certified executive coach. And I spend all my day and some evenings helping leaders communicate. And right now, that is a bit of helping leaders adjust to the new world of what people look for from them. And, and the fourth person, person is, is Jane, Mitchell. Jane Mitchell. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here from the UK, where we finally have some sun today after torrential rain. Um, I've been working in the business for far more years than I care to recall. Um, started off in broadcast TV, where leadership and communication was paramount. That still serves me well today in the world of ethics and uh, values-based leadership. So I'm sure that we'll come on to talk about everything that we've talked about. Thank you, Brad. Oh, uh, it's a it's distinguished it's a... panel. Let's talk a little bit just at the very, very beginning about... Um, this whole concept of what does it take to be a leader in communication? You know, if you were a chief executive officer and getting ready to hire someone for a position, you know, what kinds of skill sets, what would you look for in that uh, communication leader? Anybody want to take a stab at starting us off? Well, I, I, I would love to, because I think this is a huge change. I think at different points in time and perhaps different points in many of our careers, our communication skills were enough to help us land that job. If we could connect words and if we could somehow internalize a leader's voice and put those words into the leader's voice and help the leader articulate those words, then we might have a job. I think it's a totally different set of skills now. I think now we get to help a leader learn how to listen and we get to help a leader learn how to absorb what the leader may hear and, and help the leader discover not only communication skills, but a, a communication sensibility for those unscripted moments when a leader has to be aware of the impact of what is being said. So I think it's much more of a coaching role now than it is a behind the scenes prep role. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and I, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of young people who are about give to it a crack. Crack. go into the field of uh, I think that, that leadership, leadership in communication comes, comes from, from the ability to listen. to listen. So we cannot possibly communicate as communication professionals unless we're listening to what people are saying. So to your point about what would you do if you had a communicator, a potential communications uh, professional in front of you as a CEO? I would, I would look out for whether or not they're listening to what I'm saying or whether or not actually the person in front of me is just so anxious to tell me how great they are at what they can do from a tactical perspective, rather than are they listening to what I'm saying? Are they going to generate new ideas? Are they going to help me be better? as a leader, because I'm sitting in front of a communications professional leader. That's where I would go with that. And Diana, Diana I think, I think I have some of our wires, wires crossed here electronically, so I apologize for the echoes and audio issues. I know you're going to start to talk about working with students. students. 
Yeah, so, you know, I, I work with young people and I find that they define leadership very differently. And I think that um, uh, the role of a communications leader is to help executives understand how their various generations in the workplace um, value various kinds of leadership traits and what they expect. And, you know, I think the, the kinds of things that we had expected from leaders of that kind of, you know, being charismatic and able to instill confidence and credibility, you know, and being enthusiastic and all those kinds of things are not what young people are looking for necessarily. Um, they very much are looking to join organizations um, whose values align with their own. And it makes a great deal of difference to them what their leaders stand for. And so why, while a lot of organizations have been um, kind of reticent to take stands on various kinds of political or social issues, because that can be a real minefield. And a lot of times we would recommend that they stay away from that. Um, if you're looking at a younger demographic, whether they be potential employees or customers, they are looking for leaders to take stands on those issues. And we can look at what happened to Disney, uh, whose former CEO kind of didn't want to get involved in the some of the politics in, in Florida around LGBTQ issues. And the employees had a, a really strong uh, issue about that. Uh, and, and, and now Bob Iger, who's stepped in again, is somebody who has taken a public stan stance on a lot of those issues. So I think it's hard to navigate. And I think our role is to help executives understand those expectations. And, 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 I, think, and I think part of that, that is, is to, and I hear myself echo now, um, a part of that is, is for us to absorb and to listen for how people have changed in the past five years. I think I, I often consider that we were on a trajectory of change that became a turbo revolution because of everything the world went through over these past five years. And those people you describe wanting more from, from leaders, wanting to see more layers of, of leaders. We, we, we used to protect leaders and how many layers they revealed. And now I think our job becomes, how do we help a leader become comfortable in revealing more of the layers? I go back to this wonderful spontaneous moment at the start of COVID when my boss, the CEO of this global tech company, was leading the first town hall after COVID, we shut down, you know, kind of a pivotal moment. And he's on teams with 10,000 people. And there's a knock at his office, home office door. And it's his son saying, Dad, I need to print out my science paper. And he said, well, I'm on the phone. He said, I, I, have, I need it right now. And we got to see this incredible human father-son moment. And I told him after the, this was over, I said, you will never go back to being the formal CEO on the stage again. And I think that's what this period has taught us. Now, I, I was gonna say, if you went and did some stereotypical explanation of what the chief communications officer working with a CEO looked like in the past, um, it would probably have been somebody who had like, this strong newspaper background and probably chain smoked and drank martinis at lunch and nine times out of 10, if not more, was a male. Um, that's changing. And so I want to get your take on the what's it like today? And is there a future where chief communications officers and those CEO leaders that are working sort of hand in glove? look different than what it is that we've seen in the past and what we're seeing today. Um, I'll kick off because I know that we've all got something to say about that. I think that well, actually when you look at the IABC <clears throat> demographic, there are a lot of people who identify as strategic advisors. And I think I mean, that's worth an exploration at World Conference one day as to what that exactly means. <laughs> but uh, from my experience, and I, I think the phrase is cliched, but I think for the purposes of this discussion, it kind of encapsulates what goes through my mind, which is about speaking truth to power. And as an independent 
advisor to organizations, more often than not, I have found myself sitting with the chief executive. Nobody else is in the room <laughs> because everybody else has said to me, you go and talk to him about it <laughs> because he'll listen to you. And I've said to them, he'll listen to you. It's not that he's not listening to you. It's you've got to find the right way of talking to him. And they have all been him, so I have to say. Um, but they have noticed that. <laughs> and they have said, how is it that you're here and there's nobody else here? Am I really that scary? And of course, it's to, your, it's to the point that Mark is making. Their dads, their grandparents, their partners, their husband, whatever. You know, they're human beings fundamentally. Uh, and actually, you have a professional skill that they don't. And I think the point you're making, Brad, about things shifting, I think that COVID accelerated the need for them to get close and personal to communicating as opposed to having a conversation with someone who's from the comms team who comes into the room, says, OK, well, this is your latest blog. This is your latest note. This is your latest, email, whatever it might be. They've had to do it themselves. And and actually, they stepped up to it. But I think that for us or for communicators in organizations, take heart from the fact that actually, I think there is slight, slightly more, I'm not over-exaggerating this because I'm not that optimistic, a little bit more humility about what communication means post-COVID. So therefore, you can have those more robust conversations. And I think you need to have those robust conversations because the last thing you need, as Diane was talking about, you know, taking on an issue and they launch themselves into taking on an issue and then two weeks later the whole organization is having to backtrack because the ceo hasn't taken advice or you haven't given advice nightmare scenario well, I, would I would say one of the nicest benefits perhaps of the covid days and the deepest darkest of them was that we did find out that um, a communicator's role was simply not putting together the PowerPoint slides and putting on some sort of a stage show that a CEO, a leader um, could operate independently and you got to see the human side and the audience was not necessarily bored with a set of slides. And our role as communications leaders changed from, you know, creating that set of major messages that had to be communicated um, all at once into allowing somebody to do that. So, and I think that allowed us to fall into what it is that you guys are talking about, that active listening, the coaching, and a slightly different role than merely providing um, fodder for the CEO. And I think what we learned is the power of unscripted moments. And some of that power was positive. Some of that power was negative. And when we, when we appreciate the power of unscripted moments to help people make the choice, do I want to follow this leader? Then we clearly see that our role becomes, how do you prepare the leader for the unscripted moments? The moments that define whether or not people will want to follow. And I think that becomes the conversation is we can often see what others see that a leader may not see. And sometimes we become the mirror and ask them to look into it and tell us what they see. Yeah, i follow up on that. I once used the analogy of communicators being like the court jester uh, you know, and, and what did the jester do? Well, it was more than sort of entertain people. The jester was the person who could say the unspeakable right. and, and could, in humor, communicate important messages, not just from the top down, but from the, the bottom up, right? Uh, and, and I think what executives often don't have the time to do is all the listening. I mean, even if they know that they should be listening, right. they're busy folks and they need some help getting out there to get the pulse and, and, and to really understand the nuances of what people in different positions and different places are talking about and concerned about. And I think providing that kind of listening and channels for listening 
and 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 being the architect of a communication system. So now, how do you help somebody listen? How do you help get input? How do you enable people anonymously if they feel more comfortable or in other ways contribute to ideas and and join the conversation? So it's not just about you know the leaders come up with a path and now everybody's going to follow, but rather how do you get them to collaborate on every part of that process and all the strategic decision making and all the strategic planning? Mm-hmm. I, I, I just, I just, I just I love, just love the, 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 the commitment to institutional knowledge that you're describing. And, and I go back, I, back that I got, I got through those, through those years, years, and I and spent, I spent three, three or four weeks per month listening to people, and the fourth week of the month sharing what I heard with, with my boss and all of the senior leaders. That, that in-the-moment awareness of where people were emotionally enabled us when COVID began to pivot quickly and to know how far we could pivot and still keep people on our side. And, and, and it just taught me that we, if we hadn't known what we had been hearing, we would not have been able to make the immediate choices we did. And, and, and I think the big lesson from that moment is we have to, just as you described, Diane, make how we listen and then how we share what we hear the, an ultimate priority. So well said. And I'll build on that, if I may, because that takes me to um, authenticity of the message. How many times have you heard... I mean, anybody on this call, anybody listening to it, that town halls haven't been very successful because the top team or even just the CEO maybe post a crisis, maybe they think it's part of an ongoing engagement, has rocked up for a town hall, 200 people in the room, nobody speaks. And when I when that's reported to me and I hear that time and again, um, I think, okay, so why do we think that might be? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it, it is exactly to the point that you're making. It's about if the people do not believe that the leader standing up in front of them is authentic in what they are saying, then they will see through it instantly. And you see it happening, you know, people turning to each other saying, yeah, I heard that before. Nothing's ever been done. Or seriously, are they really saying that to us? Do they really understand what's going on for us? And to your point, Diane, if they have been advised by what is supposedly a strategic advisor in comms and that person has not been out and has not listened and has not heard what the mood is, then you're likely to be setting themselves up, setting them up for a fall, putting them in that situation because nobody is going to believe that it's authentically meant and the likelihood is that an unscripted conversation will not be a part of the deal because they don't go there. And I think that networking as a communicator, you, ha- you have to have the courage to do that. If you're, I think you're, you're more than likely, this is a sweeping statement, I grant you, not based on evidential data, but you're more than likely to have tendencies to be an extrovert as a communicator. Your leaders are not going to be. They are more than likely, and this is based on data, to be introverts. So therefore, you need to imbue them with that sense of understanding of who their audience is going to be and help them to be authentically delivering a message. Because as Diane said earlier, people see straight through it. And if you... I mean, it takes you 10 seconds. And if you've lost them in the first 10 seconds, you've lost them. Let me, Let me back, back up on one thought that you've talked about on the town halls and nobody wanting to speak up because I saw actually a, a, a smooth way of doing it. Just because they're not speaking up in public doesn't mean that they're not saying something. And there was always this, whether it was a Twitter stream or a team stream or sort of that talk going on while the talk was going on. It's like the old passing notes in class kind of thing. And the smartest thing I saw was maybe it's the CEO who's up speaking, 
but they would have other executives who were in that conversation who could answer and amplify and add some color and commentary. And people were much more willing to speak up and continue to say what was on their mind, not necessarily anonymously, but you know, with an identity, but not in front of the 10,000 that were watching, but in front of the people who were all sort of safely over there in the sidelines talking amongst themselves about what's going on. And I love that sort of added dimension, dimension of the, the you know, we're talking, we're talking, we're having, we're having a conversation. conversation. It is two way. It is getting out there. And it is a conversation. That's the thing. It's not a one way delivery. Like, I, I think you've put your finger on it. Yeah. yeah. But the other yeah. one that I wanted, I wanted to follow to up on and get your opinions on, because we talked a little bit about this, is that getting out. Um, um, you know, I think on the one hand, for the longest time, communications people saw themselves as the amplifier of so that top down, I've got this and I've got to get it to everyone. And now what we've been saying is the active listening aspect is sort of like the how do we get those many voices from across and get them in and or how do we encourage our leaders to get out and about and are more of them doing that with some of the electronic capabilities that they have at their disposal now and are they able to do it in an authentic way that um, makes them an active part of listening so that it's not necessarily just us delivering messages but other people doing so with their they're, we're not the filter i think yes with strong encouragement and preparation i think those who and and, and I, I think of some of the people i'm lucky enough to get to coach it's not necessarily the first idea they have back to jane's very important observation of the introvert which i don't ever let be an excuse i think that once once we help them see the impact they have and can have to people choosing to follow if they simply let themselves be present in the moments that other people are experiencing. Once they see that and they see they will survive and may actually learn something and may actually meet some new friends, I think then they're fine, then they're fine. But it, it we, we do, this is a big change in, for many of these folks. And, and we do need to use those skills we have to sometimes gently prepare them for a different world. If they were very comfortable with the protected world, and we see other indications of CEOs and other leaders wanting the world to go back to the way it was when we could control, at least when we saw people in a brick and mortar situation, but today's world is different. And so I think it is helping them see the power and the impact of when they're present and, 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 and get through it. I think part of it is that communicators used to be in the role of communicating strategy, right? And, and the strategy was, you know, done in some closed room with the C-suite and then we kind of rolled it out. And then the, the town halls would be, you know, 95%, let's roll it out. And then five, like, oh, I, we have five minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question? Well, of course, nobody says anything because even if they even if they felt emboldened enough to ask a question, they know there's not enough time to get into it. And the decision has been made. Uh, and what I have what I have been getting more involved in myself is uh, helping organizations do their strategic plans, but doing it up front in a collaborative way and establishing the systems to get input from a variety of stakeholders in a variety of ways. And then that helps the leaders to first look at that and synthesize that. And even for those who are introverts, you know, they, they feel comfortable with this because they can look at the data and then, and then understand that there's going to be a collaborative strategy. So you're not rolling out something that's a great surprise to people they actually had a role in it. But it's, uh, it's more difficult for communicators to change that part of how a business works. It's much easier for us to coach them, you know, to feel comfortable getting out in front of people and maybe even coaching them to listen a little bit more, but to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Well, the reason that people don't speak up is they know the decision's already been made. So why bother? except if you're going to stand out as a troublemaker. So you have to really intervene and, and look at the, what people want is 
they want to feel valued. They want to feel like they are contributing, right? That's what engagement is all about. And so it really just changes the decision-making process. And I also think we're in a moment where people want to see that a leader cares and that that care is authentic care. And that care, back to the, the, the point of taking positions on issues that impact me, that that degree of care extends to a leader using the platform to advocate for what I feel is right and, and, and wanting to feel that I'm a part of an organization that will stand up and fight for those things that matter to me. And, and that is, that's a sensitive area for us to work in that involves really getting underneath how a, a, a leader thinks and forms opinion and is willing to share and sees the role and also what the ultimate impact can be upon people. But it's, a, it's an important place for us to be prepared to go. So I think part of our preparation as communicators is how do we prepare ourselves to have conversations with leaders that we haven't had before? Because either we weren't invited or they weren't a part of the agenda or they, we didn't see it as part of our job. Well, and I also think that the leaders in most organizations are used to controlling things, whether it's the bottom line or people or the workforce or the direction. And how do you get leaders to give up some of this control, uh, desire for control in a world where maybe they can't control some things like communications? I think it can be freeing because I think that they don't have all the answers. And it's pretty scary to think that I'm in charge. I've got to make all the decisions and make people happy about them. Um, I think it's a lot easier if they can feel like uh, they are in charge of the process and they do make some final decisions and some of the tough ones, but they're the ones who are the leaders of the orchestra. They're not playing every instrument. And, and so I think by even helping them frame their job and giving them the tools for shared decision-making and shared input and communication along the way, I think it, it relieves some of the burden from them. Um, I think one of the most valuable things that I found as a leader, I, I did an 11 year stint as Dean and it was humbling because I saw that it wasn't always easy to follow the advice that I could give myself as a, as a leadership consultant, right? Um, but the thing that I valued most is asking people, like rolling, rolling out an idea and saying, look, don't tell me how great it is. Tell me where this might fail. Tell me what I'm not seeing. Please help me because I don't want to fail and you don't want me to fail. So your job is to play devil's advocate. Tell me everything that's wrong with this. What am I not thinking about? Who's not consulted? You know, we, we need to hear that. And it was very freeing for me to feel like I didn't have to come up with the perfect idea and roll it out. I, I, it was it was a shared power. So I think in a way we we might be able to change their mental model of what it means to be a leader and maybe take some of the stress from them because it's not an easy job. If you look at um, what's happening in leadership in many organizations, the turnover, the churn is awful. In higher ed now, the average tenure of a college president is a couple of years. That used to be a job that people had for decades, right? Uh, and now people are leaving in less than a year. There are two of them, in fact, who have gone missing. Like we think that maybe there's been an alien abduction or something, but the job is so incredibly awful because of all the pressures they're facing that some of them are just like packing up in the middle of the night and going somewhere. So, you know, these, these jobs are not as cushy as we might think they are. And, and our job is to try to get them to change what that mental model is because we need them to survive. We need leaders. And, and I think the same, the tenure, to your point, Diane, for CEOs is falling as well. Not as dramatically as that. I mean, wow, that is a, that is a huge drop. But I think for communicators in the organization, 
in a way, the communication leaders in the organization, what you're making me think about is that role of not just strategic advisor, but trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. You have to put yourself in their shoes. I, I grant you that's not necessarily a very comfortable place to be, but you do have to understand what they're going through in order to help them listen to what you're saying, for them to hear what you're saying, actually. Um, and one would hope that you can also help them develop their listening skills more broadly beyond you. But they do have to hear you, but they won't hear you if you only focus on what you want them to do you have to work with them to make them feel comfortable with what you want them to do so if you're if your natural instinct is to say right this is what we're going to do we're going to get on with it stop just stop take a step back and think okay how are they going to react to that how am i going to get them to do that and once you get them to just dip their toe into something that is not too scary, but takes them a little bit forward, you'll be able to take them even further forward than that. But don't try and do it all at once, just because you know that that's the right thing to do to, to the point that Diane is making, which is a really brilliant point, is it's a really scary place to be. And it yours your role is not quite as scary as that, even though it might feel like it, it just isn't. And, and, we, and, we, and we accomplish we so, much, so more much more when we focus on the person and then go to the process. And, and we, love, we love as communicators to, to have all the answers. And we love to walk in and say, and you do this and you do this and you do this. So I think part of the releasing control is our releasing our own sense of control and focusing on the person and what is that person experiencing, both at work and maybe outside of work, that can impact how this leader is, is perceived and how comfortable this leader is to reveal. And when we, when we get to connect with the person, we then have a much richer opportunity to actually make a difference. Now, is this role that we've been talking about in terms of a communications person being able to um, walk in and read the room, understand what's going on in a, a leader's life, is that something that comes naturally? Is it something that could be trained? Do you have to have X number of years of experience in, in seeing uh, leaders in different places to be able to provide that sort of wisdom and counsel and um, authenticity and play the court gesture and all these things that we have been talking about. How how do you get to that point? I, I think that I don't think it's as much about years of experience as it is whether there is a match. I think it's a little bit different than being an expert in accounting to be the CEO or expert in supply chain. I think if there's not the kind of trusting relationship that all of us are talking about, that it's not going to work. And so I think one of the things we may need to recognize is that different leaders may need different communication counsel. And it doesn't mean that you're incompetent. Or it just may mean that there's not a good match between you and that person. I've seen very junior people become a very trusted advisor oh, yeah, just yeah. because the personality clicks or they're able to see something in that person um, and be able to coach them. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's like any other kind of matchmaking. So it does make our jobs, I think, a little different, a little riskier in that just because we know the latest technology or we can write well doesn't mean that we're going to have a long tenure across the all, changes of all kinds of CEOs. It, it may not. So, so I actually teach a course um, every every semester. So it, in, the, in a master's program at NYU in, in executive coaching and in consulting. And and the focus of the course is on how you become a trusted advisor. And it, it, it's interesting because I, I, I totally agree, Diane. It's not a function of age or experience. I do think there is a degree of instinct. I think there is a degree of... Of, of curiosity. 
I think that there is a matter of stepping out of our needing to be the smartest one in the room to enabling someone else to flourish. And I think that we have to give up the, the control that we once felt was essential to our success in order to trust the person we're talking with to make the right choices. And so I do think it is, but it boils down just as you described to that, that chemistry that either happens between people or doesn't. Yeah, and I, I, I also, also say, say that, that most, of, most of our backgrounds don't include training like you just described. I think we were, you know, the words, the video, the technology, the process, and that's where our comfort zone is. And as again, communications people, I think one thing that we need to add into our portfolio, portfolio our, training, our training is recognizing, is recognizing that it is, is something, something along, along the line, line of, of interpersonal, interpersonal communication, communication from the one-on-one -on -one -on -one all the way all to the, the one-to-many. One -many. And I'll add to that. So back in the very early part of my career, I was working in broadcast television. And it taught me, I think, probably 95% of what we're talking about here. Because I was very young, uh, straight from college, where I was there at 19. And I was lucky enough to be thrown into live television programming. programming. And as you might imagine, there are production teams, large production teams, to get programs on air. And the first program, first two programs I worked on were live. So what it, and I didn't really understand, I didn't really understand the enormity of what I was experiencing until I came out and started working in corporate organizations. Although I have to say the organization I was working for was a corporate organization. And I left it for that reason. However, that was not to do with what I was programming. Within the program itself, it was really clear from the off that everybody knew what their role was. And it didn't matter that I was a production secretary because I had a very specific role and everybody was clear of the value of that. So therefore, I was clear of the value of that. And the thing that joined all of us to the point that you're all making was that we knew precisely what we had to do and we all agreed what it was. So we weren't, <clears throat> which is what happens a lot in my experience in corporate world, we will say one thing and do another, or I as the CEO will be heading in that direction, but actually there are some leaders around me who might be heading in all their different directions. And then for a communicator, he's in amongst this mix, thinking, what the hell, where, where am I heading? And that, I think, is a fundamental role for us, is to bring our leaders back to where, it is, where is it that we are all heading? And this is not just about that group over there, that group over there, this silo here, that region, this, this uh, business, this part of the business. Let's identify our purpose Let's head towards that. And the person who keeps those people, leaders anchored in that is the communicator, because that's what you're there to do. And, and that, I think, is really critical, binding what Mark and Diane and Brad said as well. Well, I think one of our strengths historically has always been connecting the dots. And historically, we've not really focused on some of those leadership, leadership kinds, kinds of things, of things but, instead but instead more of the more messaging, messaging jobs. jobs. And I think, I think what we've what got, we got is sort of a role, role, to, be role to be able to play, play a, a, an integral part, part in helping, in helping that, that leader leader and maybe, maybe I should say leaders, leaders become, become more successful. More successful. And, it is, and it is not just not, not just one, it's, one. It's, it's, it's sort of seeing, seeing the disconnect as much as it connects and then able to hook everybody together. Totally. Totally. And to help, help leaders, leaders recognize, recognize we're in, we're a, in a moment. I, I, I've shared this story before, but it, it always reminds me why we have to free ourselves from what we think a moment is about to truly be in, in, in the moment. And it, it is a, a day many of us remember, the day of the Sandy Hook um, tragedy, December 2012, and I was working at the nearby hospital that was the destination for any survivors and was also the destination for every 
name in broadcast news in the eastern United States because there was no other place to go to get a story. And my boss, who I adore, is a doctor. He's not comfortable. He was new in the CEO role, didn't really know what all this was about. There were some well-intentioned communicators trying to give him message points. And I had to have one of those moments when I said, I think I need the room. And I looked at him and I said, why did you become a doctor? And he said, it's a lovely question. Could we talk about that later? And I said, no, I'm serious. Why did you become a doctor? And he said, because I wanted to heal people. And I said, and today we need you to be a doctor and heal people. Don't worry about the message points. Don't worry about who turning on the camera. Don't worry about any of that. Be who you are. And I think sometimes the most important counsel we can provide is to let leaders be who they are in the moments that demand they be who they are. And that's letting everything go and trusting them. Yeah, I think that's that's really well said. And and then there are all the moments that are not as dramatic. And I think also some of what we haven't talked about is some of the more day-to-day -day advisory kinds of things. And I think the other thing that that I think about, especially again in my role being around young people, is that leaders um, are confused about all these new kinds of communication channels and what they should be using and what they should be getting into and uh, personally and professionally where they should be and how they might employ them. And I think we have to be the ones they would uh, expect us to be the ones who could guide them and be the ones on top of that kind of research and being able to fill them in quickly about how to use these channels, right? I mean, given all the authenticity and the trust and all, all of that that we're talking about, there is, there certainly is, there's still part of that. I think all of us came from some kind of broadcast or newspaper kind of background, but there is still a technical part of it that we can't completely give up or we're going to, we're going to miss out as well. Yeah, we have to be inquisitive, I think is a great way of thinking about it, sort of constantly inquisitive about new technologies, new processes, new environments in which we're working. And I've often said that part of our job is as we, I would say, mature or grow in this is much less about some of the technologies, be aware of them and maybe how to plug them into the program, but it's to create that communications environment and recognize it's a changing communications environment. And just because you're enamored of a certain app or a certain way of doing things, there's going to be something that comes along that upsets that apple cart. I want to change just a little bit. And we've been talking about how we can be effective with, but you know, oftentimes, and I'm sure you all have had that same question thrown your way, is um, how do you reach the leader who is reticent? You know, how do you break through the ones that sort of don't get it or the, you know, the, how do I change? If only my leader were more like that, um, is there a way to, you know, what, what kind of counsel or what kind of uh, strategies do you employ when you look at something like that? Well, Brad, I, usually the only people I get to work with are those who are reticent. And they aren't necessarily coming to me as a coach because they want to. They're coming to me as a coach because someone has said, you're not getting through to people and we have to figure out why. So I think that that's a great question. I think it begins with helping someone uncover what makes me comfortable about the communication part of my role and what in turn makes me confident about myself in that part of the role. And if I can kind of figure, help, help a leader discover those two things, my comfort and my confidence, then that can then charter a path for how we might travel. But I think back to Jane's observation of these of many being introverts, what we do is not natural for, for many people. And we before we jump into the hope that they'll jump into the pool, we have to kind of help them determine how how hesitant they may be. I think there's another type as well. 
And I, funnily enough, I was, I think it is a great question. And I was thinking, I hope Brad doesn't ask us this question. <laughs> but I was thinking, I was thinking that there will be people who are listening to us and watching this who are thinking, well, that all sounds really great and utopian, but what if I have a boss? First of all, the reticent one, which I think is more manageable. And I do think that actually Mark's guidance and um, understanding of that is is really good to hold on to. But what if you have a boss who really thinks that he or she, um, and I'm sure that we can all think of people in the public eye and in business who think that they know how it is and therefore you're just there as the lackey there. You're there to just press all the buttons and do what is asked of you. What do you do in those circumstances? And this came up at an IABC session that we had in our AGM in June, actually. And um, it was asked by young communicators. And they said, well, what do you, what do, you do then? Because the subject of the discussion was excellence in communication. And, we, and there was a group of five of us. And all of us said, this is the point at which if you have kept going and if you have tried what you believe to be the right thing, if you have joined dots, if you have worked with other leaders to try and understand where this person is going and you are not getting through, that is the point at which you have to make that courageous decision for yourself and your organisation. And back to Diane's earlier point is this is not going to work. This is a relationship that isn't going to work because you will not be able to deliver your professional skills at the best you want to be and therefore you won't be able to do it for them or the organization or anybody around you really and I think that you just have to bite that bullet when that happens I I don't think I think as we're saying you know they're all human beings so they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes moods and ways of doing stuff and it it is the decision that you have to make I think I guess I would also say that many IABC members are independent consultants uh, and others are in more junior levels, as you, as you mentioned, Jane. I think there's a certain amount of patience also because you have to know what, what you're being brought in for or what your job is. And, um, and sometimes you want to grow into something that is more strategic and being the boss's advisor. Uh, and that's not the role yet or you haven't developed that trust, or there is an immediate need for some more tactical implementation or decision-making. Um, and, and it's a personal decision as to how long you're gonna stay in that role. Um, I often as an external consultant would be brought in for more menial kinds of things or more tactical kinds of things, like you know, explain to us this new technology and help us embrace it. And then I, I would immediately see some problems at a higher level, but I knew that I had to get their trust first. I had to learn more about them. Uh, and in fact, they might have had some pressing problem that they needed some help, that a pair of hands with. And unless you're able to jump in and do some of that work, it's hard to work your way up to being that strategic advisor. So, you know, I, I find that we also have to have some humility to be able to work at different levels. We're not always being asked the big questions, right? Sometimes we do need to fix the microphone. <laughs> and, and sometimes, oh, I'm sorry, Mark, is it sometimes, isn't it the, um, you need to be asked to be able to give advice. It's like the person wants or needs your help and sort of confesses to it or admits that. Um, the other thing that I'm slightly encouraged by is seeing the number of programs where leaders, the CEOs who are going up through the MBA programs are now either um, asked to take a class in communications leadership, or um, I've been a, an executive coach of some of the MBA students at Stanford University in the past. And I'm now helping one of our colleagues, uh, Theo Mary Karamanis, who's got now a required course for people in their exec MBA program at Cornell, they have to take a class, these aspiring leaders of the future in their MBA studies. So maybe we're getting people who are exposed to this as they're coming up, and this is a skill set that you will need to master as a leader and not just a nice to, it's gonna be 
expected of you in the future? To be fair, <laughs> to be fair, most leaders don't get trained to be leaders. <laughs> they, they get trained to improve the bottom line. That's the issue. That Fundamentally, that has been the issue. And unfortunately, it still continues to be, especially in such a volatile kind of uncertain world that we're what we have at the moment that speed of change that we were talking about 10 years ago we say oh change is a constant wow change is not a constant it is moving so incredibly fast at different rates all of the time and uh, and leaders are not inherently asked to be great values based decision makers they're not trained to be great listeners they're not trained to be great communicators but i think that the word is spreading and i think it's fantastic to hear that you're doing that with theo mary but it, it, they're fundamental leadership skills or habits if you will that we can help them get better at and do more of to the point that that wonderful story that mark gave you know which was why did you become a doctor? Yeah, lovely question, but let's talk about that later. No, let's get down to the heart of you. And yeah, that's yeah. what we want here. And that's really critical. And, 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 and I think the skills, skills we have to, to see around the corner and to see around the corner in terms of how people may react and who leaders may need to be and then to trust our, our own instinct and our ability to ask questions and at time ask permission to offer our opinions. I think that if we can bring that sensitivity to all this change, then we provide value. Where we don't provide value is where we walk in and we immediately have all the answers. So I think there are times we have to maybe coach ourselves and and listen and absorb in the same way we hope leaders do. Yeah, I'm reminded of a uh, getting to work with one executive. I, I, I had the blessing of getting to work at Hewlett Packard and seeing um, sort of a culture that was renowned around the world and, and emulated by many places. And one of the tenets of the culture was management by wandering around, which sort of said executives have to get out and do some of that active listening, not only about work issues, but also getting to know the people on their teams. And you just couldn't sit in an office and wait for things to come your way. But it's also one where, yeah, it's been, theoretically it's great, but to get people to practice that, or in the case of Dave Packer, who stood about six feet four, to be able to walk into an assembly area and come up to someone and not scare them to death that this is, oh my God, the CEO, um, one of my favorite questions though, that I, I helped uh, an exec VP with, um, he was able to, like he knew where the people were and he would come and like plop himself down in a chair with somebody who's sitting there working and said, what are you working on? And on one hand, it's a very challenging question. It's sort of like, you're not wasting time. You're not playing video games or doing something stupid, are you? But on the other hand, it's showing a keen interest in that person's job and then trying to see whether that person knows how to connect what it is that they're doing with that bigger, here's the direction, here's where we're all going. And I had one of those people who was um, asked that question come back to me and say, this is the first time any top leader has ever come and asked um, what it is that I was doing. And you, know, and you know what happens is that person goes and tells all of his or her friends and, and that kind of networking and that kind of messaging behind the scenes is so powerful. I mean, there is a symbolism to communications as well as some of the um, active sort of pragmatic on the surface stuff that we're probably more used to dealing with and, and worry about. But I think we need to start looking at that again, sort of the environment and the, and the mega picture. That's a really that's a really great example that, spring, that uh, brings to my mind an example of a leader who was trying to get his team big team, a couple of hundred people, not to work so hard because they were overworking, which meant that what they were doing was suffering in a way that he could see. And he wanted them to be clear headed, making great decisions, coming up with terrific new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, look, you don't have to start work at seven o'clock in the morning and you don't have to leave at seven o'clock at night. Trust me when I say that to you. OK, so what did he do? 
He continued to come in at seven and leave at seven. And what did they do? Look around and think, well, okay, I heard what he said. And he genuinely meant it. And he was really surprised. He couldn't understand why everybody was still doing it. So I said to him, have you thought that maybe what you're you're talking about, Brad, is that that symbolism of what you're doing, in spite of what you've said, is really terrifying them because they they love you and they believe what you said, but actually you're still doing it. Yeah, but I have to for so and so. Well, do it somewhere else then. Come in later and just convince them that actually you did mean it and that you do want them to do that. But that, of course, to your point, Brad, is not traditional communications advice but it is a way of communicating. And therefore, if you can be build up that relationship of trusted advisor and hear what's going on, see what's going on, then you can be incredibly useful. So Mark, you're nodding. I was gonna say, we're getting down sort of toward the end of our show. Maybe there's like one more example that you have or something you wanna add or something we haven't covered that we're missing. So here's a chance to, um, get on the soapbox and say, you know what people really need to understand is this. Any takers on that one want to like jump yeah. in? Yeah, that we can, we can adjust to this change we've described. And all we have to do is look through the years at all the changes we've had to absorb. And for many of us, how we communicate has completely changed since we decided that this is the world we wanted to work in. And then also we should look at those things that haven't changed and that our work is fundamentally about how people connect with each other. And today there are more ways for those connections to happen. And there are more ways that connections won't happen and more reasons. And it's always been the communicator's job to be the glue that can maneuver around the things that are naturally helping people connect and those that are getting in the way. So I think we're well prepared for whatever new worlds we have to communicate in and who we work with. I guess I would encourage people to look at job descriptions and see if it matches at all what we think we're talking about. Because I think sometimes there's a disconnect uh, in what people expect us to do and what we want to do. And it goes back to what how the job is defined. And maybe that, that's where things need to change a bit to try to articulate that that's what this job is about. I would say, uh, building on those two things, which I absolutely agree with, is use your connections within the IABC. When you look at young, I've looked at young communicators over the years developing their career in IABC, it is a constant theme which says thank you to, and a whole list of people that have offered really uh, fantastic advice, support, encouragement, courage. But this community is incredibly generous. And there's a lot of people all around the world who are very willing to share their stories. So if you're if you're floundering in a business and think, oh, I don't know how to lead on this particular thing, ask somebody um, and, use, and use this community. I think that's a powerful way to uh, say thank you to Jane Mitchell. Thank you to Diane Gasky. Thank you to Mark Schumann for sharing some of those powerful stories and helping move people along on this whole notion of leadership communication, communication and where is, where is it and where is it, it, where is it going. going. Um, I would also like to remind you that in a month, uh, Michelle Holtz will be back in this seat. He is going to be leading a panel of fellows, um, Priya Bates, Neil Griffiths, Rajiv Kumar, and Atisha Narvaez on the topic of global diversity awareness. So a change of gears, entirely different. So I hope that you will uh, join that. I also say that I know that a number of people use these recordings to be able to study for their GCCC exams, the CMP and the SCMP exams. So one of the beauties of this is, you know, if you've found this to be a great resource, share that information with some people and uh, go from there. So again, thank you. 
all three for spending some time with us to talk about leadership communications. And we um, thank you for joining us for this. And we will see you downstream. Thank you. And well done, Brad.